So my name is Neil McHale. I am a long-term Googler, and I should point out at this stage that I am not a parent. Um, however, I did grow up gay in 1980s Ireland, so hopefully I'll be able to contribute a little bit to the conversation, um, probably more about what um, uh, uh, not inclusive parenting actually looks like. So I'm just going to introduce the panel now. So firstly, we have uh, Lynn Tracy, who is a well-known figure in Irish advertising, and um, was the first female president of the Irish uh, Institute of Advertising Practitioners in Ireland and is on the board of uh, many non-for-profit organisations, including Trans Equality Network Ireland. Um, we have Bella Fitzpatrick, um, who is the Exec Director of Shoutout, a community of volunteers dedicated to improving uh, the lives of LGBTQ um, people in, in Ireland through education, um, and has reached thousands of its students through workshops that have been focused on tackling bullying. Um, we have uh, Dil uh, Withrimixinga, and I know I said it earlier okay, but I think I struggled through that one. Um, so Dale is a broadcaster, journalist, and activist, um, well known for um, her award-winning program on news talk um, radio called Global Village, um, as well as weekly podcasts and TEDx talks. Um, and last but very not least, um, we have uh, Shiran Aharon, who is a senior exec here at Google and is the Dublin lead for the Gaglers and Allies Employee Relations um, Group. So thank you all very much for taking some time for us today. Um, the way we're going to run this is I've got some questions that I'm going to um, throw to the panel, um, but would love this to be as interactive as possible. So give people an opportunity to start thinking about questions now. Um, so maybe to get us kicked off, I'm conscious that that was a very brief introduction that I gave. So I'd love to just ask each one of you to introduce yourselves in a little bit more detail and um, do yourselves a bit more justice than I possibly could have. And maybe tell us about your journey to inclusive parenting and why you think it's so important. So maybe if we start with you, Lynn. I deliberately sat here so Sharan would be first. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to mix it up. That <laughs> cunning plan didn't work. Um, hi. Uh, uh, inclusive parenting kind of came to us. I would have hoped that we would have been inclusive parents uh, regardless of our own personal circumstances. But uh, I have four children, three of whom identified as male at birth and one of whom identified as female. And on the fourth, of, uh, gender has always been a conversation in our house since my oldest, who's now 21, was 13. And there was, there, people are very righteous in our house about um, social issues and, and, and people's rights. And uh, when on the 4th of March 2016, my second eldest came in to me and said, uh, Mum, I think I might be transgender. And uh, it was definitely a surprise. Um, and there was, a lot of crying and a lot of hugging that night. Um, uh, I, is, am I allowed to swear? Oh, swear away. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> when I told my husband, he goes, well, that's some great big cosmic fuck up, isn't it? So, uh, but in a positive way, as opposed to in a negative way. And um, so we were very lucky. We live in Dublin. We have a really good GP. We made an appointment to see our GP. Our GP was incredibly supportive of, of my child. Um, we were referred Luckily, at the time, there was, a, there was a psychiatrist here because you obviously have to be diagnosed with gender dysphoria. And this psychiatrist had just moved and this was her specialization. So um, Aileen Murta out in um, Willow Grove. So we were diagnosed, we got seen very quickly. And in June of 2016, we got, she got her diagnosis. And we just came out absolutely publicly um, because it's not anybody else's story. It's not scandal, it's not gossip. This is who my child is. Um, she got her gender recognition certificate uh, a year ago. Her name is Alice Rosa Toomey. Bizarrely, it is much easier to get a gender recognition certificate than it is to open a bank account for a 16-year-old. And that is, is very true, but there are many flaws in the system. But she's in college now. She's a wonderful person, so I'm a very proud trans parent. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Lynn. Uh, so, Sharan, maybe we will go to you this time. <clears throat> um, yes. Um, so, being gay and coming out to my uh, very religious family in Israel wasn't uh, the best in closing parenting uh, experience that I could have. But being a mom now uh, to a one year and eight months boy, uh, for me, it's very important to raise him as an, an inclusive parenting, to make sure that educate him that there is a diverse world, to make sure that he respected individuals uh, for who they are and um, respect and be uh, with compassion to one another and understand that there is a world of diversity 
other people around us. Um, being a same-sex parents with a one year and eight months old boy, it's also making sure that we are very diverse and very um, different to most of the families that we are out there, heterosexual families. So we are very different from other families that you see around us. So. For us, it's very important also to make sure that this is something that's being discussed about our challenges and our advantages also, being a same-sex parents and um, being celebrated out there as well. Thank you, Sharan. Um, Bella. Is this working? It no? is indeed. Yeah, oh, okay. it is working. Um, I'm also not a parent, but I am the mom of my friend group. <laughs> so, is that the same? Totally no. the same. Not quite the same. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a parent um, because um, that looks really hard. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I do um, run educational workshops on LGBT issues for people who work with young people or people who are parents or guardians or foster parents or social workers or youth workers or, you know, parent means a lot of different things and it really does take a village. Uh, to, to raise a to raise a young person and and um, really to shed yourself of the assumptions and that's really what being an inclusive parent is is listening to your child and and not saying no when they tell you something about themselves just being like okay parenting from my outside expert opinion having not been a parent seems like improv um, where you just say yes and uh, so hey you know. I'm, I'm, I'm a girl, yes, and <laughs> what, your name, and yeah, that type of thing. So it's all, it's all about it being child-led rather than it being led from your assumptions from the world, which is a fundamentally a broken place. <laughs> so we will uh, get some opinions from the, the other parents about whether it actually is like improv or not, but thank you, Bella. <laughs> thank you. So my full name is Mehinda Kulasuri Nancy Lea Dilhani Vikramasinghe. That's so I can answer perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> that's not my address, that's not my life story. So people usually ask me where am I from, born and brought up in Italy, parents are Sri Lankan, lived in the Middle East working as a flight attendant, I don't know where your emergency exits are in case of an emergency, <laughs> and moved to Ireland uh, 19 years ago. And like Sharan, um, I came from a very religious background, my parents were Jehovah's Witnesses. So and the, when I was 16 when Madonna's song Express Yourself was in the charts that summer. And as a Jehovah's Witness girl, while preaching, my eyes locked with another Jehovah's Witness girl, and I fell madly in love, and we had the most amazing love affair in that, that summer with Madonna's Express, Your Song, Express Yourself as a soundtrack. But I knew when I came out, it would be absolute disaster, and it was, because they actually threw me out on the streets when I was 16 years old, and I was homeless for four years. So, like many LGBTQ people, I felt I had to emigrate to find a country where I could be myself. So that's why I ended up going to Bahrain first, and then finally I found myself uh, here in Ireland. And coincidentally, my arrival in Ireland coincided with Dublin Pride. So within 24 hours of my feet touching Irish soil, I found myself dancing down O'Connell Street singing, It's Raining Men. <laughs> it was really bizarre. Uh, but that, that was a pivotal moment because it was broad daylight. For the first time in my life, I was surrounded by people who were like me and were proud of who they were. And that was the real beginning for me. And then, you know, trauma has a way of, uh, you know, uh, rearing its ugly head when you're safe. And unfortunately, in 2006, it did. And I found myself in a really bad way. And I went into one in four, got counseling, and it was in front of a you know, in front of a psychotherapist that I found myself, you know, uh, going into this, you know, journey of trying to remove all these horrible messages that I had received from my parents. And one of those messages was, gay people shouldn't have children. And up until six years ago, that's what I carried. That was probably one of the last things that I had to forcibly uh, remove from myself. And thankfully I did, because, um, I met Amory, my wife. Um, we set up a, a mental health support service that really uh, provides inclusive um, uh, services to the LGBTQ community. That was our firstborn. And then our secondborn, a four-year-old, Phoenix, was born in the week of the marriage referendum. He wow. was meant to arrive the 1st of June, but of course, I was just too excited <laughs> that he came early and he wanted to be part of uh, Irish history, I suppose. And, and, then, and it didn't help that at that time, I was the first lesbian in, in the public eye who was working as a journalist was very open about my pregnancy because the no campaigners were like, if you, if you let the gays get married, they're all going to have children. So we were like, okay, well, this is what it's going to look like. 
Are we, are we scary? No, right? And then, so I carried Phoenix, and then two years later, um, Amory uh, had Xavier. So uh, one of the advantages of two mums is that there's four boobs. So there's like, you know, it does lots of bre breastfeeding, we take turns, you know, and it's just pretty. And also the other thing is everything that Amory kind of got wrong with me when I was breastfeeding, we had a home birth, actually our home birth was actually televised and shown on telly. Um, so when she, she kind of like, never say to a pregnant woman I mean, they've, uh, if they're hungry, but you just ate. Oh, cool. Never say that. Because then, two years later, Amory was like practically devouring the sandwich, and I was like, mm, I could, uh, yeah, I don't want to say anything. <laughs> so yeah, so inclusive parenting is something that I care about uh, hugely, and I'm so privileged to be here today to talk to you. But it's 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 a challenge because every day, like just this morning, uh, Phoenix looks very much like me. Uh, he, he's a mini me, and Xavier is a mini Anne Marie. And this morning, uh, just a, a lady off the street came up to us. Oh my God, your kids are cute, so cute. Oh, oh, you just you look just like your mom. And then she, she looked at my daughter, and oh, you must have you must have daddy's eyes, you know. That complete stranger on the street. So it's like you coming as a gay person, you always have to come out. As a same-sex parent, you you con continuously having to come out. So that can have its challenges. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> Definitely learned a little bit more about what some of the advantages of same-sex parenting are there. Um, maybe just to keep on that thread with same-sex parenting, maybe just to, to turn to you, Sharon. Are there like what are some of maybe the challenges and advantages that you've seen? Yes. Um, so unfortunately, still today, there are lots of uh, illegal um, and legal issues and operational issues that same-sex parents are in facing when they want to become parents. Um, it's rarely that you have uh, same-sex parents that become parents accidentally. Um, and uh, when you... <laughs> um, and becoming a parent, uh, unfortunately, we are facing a lot of legal and operational issues. Still, same-sex marriage is illegal in many countries, and in some countries there are still also forbidden rules on being LGBTQ people. Um, becoming parents, even here in Ireland, and for us, my wife and myself, um, we wanted to be both registered as a birth certificate for our son, but unfortunately here in Ireland it cannot happen. So we had to go to Belfast in order to deliver our son, in order to be both registered as a birth certificate, uh, as mom for our kids. So small things that for some people seems very trivial and obvious, for us it's not obvious and we need to um, face them when becoming parents and to think about it. So cost of having also uh, a child and going on through the procedures of having a child, this is something that very much thought through and we are need to face when becoming parents. Um, except of that, we are also have, unfortunately, still people saying mm -hmm. that gay parents shouldn't be parents. And that um, raising a kid without the opposite sex gender is basically not raising the kids in an environment that they should be. Um, so facing those situations of discrimination that still exist and having those kind of like issues when you have, we are exposed to and our kid is exposed to is unfortunately um, challenging as well. Advantages of being same-sex parents, we are very well committed. It was a very thought process that it took us a lot of time in order to bring our kid to the world. We are very committed parents and um, very invested in our kid because we had a, it, it took us a while until we managed to bring our kid to the world. And um, so very committed, open-minded, uh, raising for tolerance and resilience and making sure our kid is being raised as an inclusive parenting and understanding the diverse of the world and that there are different peoples and different cultures and how to embrace all of them. Thank you. Maybe just, um, just to build on that, so you know, particularly as a non-parent, like, how do you experience some of that discrimination um, from people saying that gay people shouldn't be parents? Like, is it, is it online? Like, would people actually say it to you? Some of them are online. Some of them can be people saying it to us, uh, especially, again, growing up in Israel and being the daughter of a very religious uh, parents uh, that also being taught that uh, gay people shouldn't uh, have rights or shouldn't be parents and should be like a second type citizenship in the world. Um, it's very hard to face those situations when you, um, you're just even going into the supermarket and some people are throwing comments to you. Um, and even when, not recently, we were on a flight and um, it was my wife and uh, myself and our son, and a flight attendant came to us and asked me to move. And she never 
ask someone else to move if they would be um, a different sex parents. And we said, but we are together, we are a family. And she said, yes, but um, she will be able to manage by herself. Can you move, please? We want these seats for another parents to sit with his daughter. Um, so those kind of situation we are still facing, unfortunately. Very sorry to hear that. Um, I'm conscious we've been talking about um, sexual identity here and same-sex parenting. Um, you know, obviously we just need to be sensitive about kind of conflating sexual identity um, with uh, gender identity. So maybe Lynn, you can uh, just give us a little bit more on. You know, we've we've heard from from Dylan Sharan, like what is the experience that you've um, been, and should we be thinking about this differently, perhaps in terms of how we respond to it? Um, it, I, I would, as I said earlier, I would have considered myself uh, relatively, you know, versed in gender politics and sexual politics and so forth. And it's, I, I only know now how little I know yet, um, you know, that it's just a constant learning. And there is, people do conflate gender identity with sexual identity. And, and it's something Dill said, and I, I, I'm really gobsmacked by some of the questions you get asked. And it's not from malice or... or or you know th that they p p people wanting to be purient. It's actually they're just kind of thinking this is the kind of question I would ask. So I, you know, whenever it comes up that Alice is transgender, people go, oh, so how far along is she? Oh and uh, has she had the surgery yet? And is she having the surgery? And um, so how does that work, you know, physic? I mean, I'm, I'm set on there and I'm going, well, should I ask you about your genitalia or your, about your children's genitalia? Because everybody's journey is so different. And Alice's journey is completely her own decision, how far she wants to go, how far she doesn't want to go. That's not my, I would never, I wouldn't ask her, I'm her mother. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be guided by what she wants. So, and people assume then, you know, well, oh, she's transgender, so is she gay? You know, and it's it, you know that that conflating of of um, of those those things. It was quite interesting. And I, a, a colleague of mine who was on the the Tenny board, proudly says, "Well, I used to be straight, and now I'm two of the LGBTs because I'm now gay and trans, whereas before I wasn't either of them." You know, so it, it it is, and I think it's 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 a wider educational role. Now I have to say, you know, I do believe we live in a bit of a bubble with with my family and where we live and the schools and everything that we've been through. Um, but we've really had very little negativity directed at us, and I, maybe part of that is because we we kind of came out so overtly and kind of you know it's very hard to be difficult when people have said this is who we are. Um, but it it, it yeah it's very it's very frequently conflated, and as I say, the more I know, the more I realise I don't know is is the reality. And I think as you said, like education, obviously a key part of that. So you know maybe Bella through the outreach that you do in schools, like again, how do you see some of the kind of sexual identity versus gender identity and you know, how do you respond to it? <laughs> well, I think it's important to show that like the reason why LGBTQIA, P plus, how many, however many letters you want to put in, like the reason they're all together is because the root cause of our discrimination is the same. Um, and that really stems from uh, a very narrow understanding of both biological sex and of gender. So what I would ask is, with adults when I'm doing training, with, be they social workers or parents or whatever, you know, when someone has a baby, what's the first thing everybody asks? Is it a boy or a girl? Boy or a girl, you know. Why do we ask this? You know, there's not a lot to ask, really. You know, like, babies are, they're not, they don't have that many interests. So, <laughs> you know, like, I, yeah, yeah, I just, like, I don't even think about gender in that way at all, but still, my cousin had a baby, and my brain was like, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. And I was like, oh, boy or a girl. <laughs> Um, you know, why do we do that? It's such a weird thing to do. And then, you know, we ask why, and some people say, because you might want to buy like a pink thing or a blue thing. Or like, yeah, I got to color code our baby so people know what their genitalia is. That's normal. Um, you know, that's a flawed system, and it comes packaged with so many different things. It comes packaged with, with behavioral ideals. Boys will act like this, girls will act like this, boys will fancy girls, girls will fancy boys. And that, like, it's all. It's all one big mess. It's one big ball of Christmas lights that's all tangled. So really, while yes, individual groups have certain needs, absolutely, and deserve their own space, we are all fighting the same cis heteropatriarchy, you know, that we're all trying to smash together. So try to see them as, yes, individual, you know, communities, but also we're all fighting the same thing, which actually impacts 
everyone. So to try not to make it seem like these are, you know, these rights over here, but they are mm. actually impacting everyone. Like I, my, my mom, you know, I'm not, I wasn't raised by LGBT parents, but I was raised by a single parent. So I would still get questions like, oh, you must look like your dad. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Or even things like, I have my mom's maiden name, and then sometimes, you know, you're filling out a form, and that's for your mother's maiden name, and it'll be like, you won't be able to continue, because it's like, no, it must be different to your last name. And I'm like, you know, that people can have babies without marriage. Come on, Karen. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's about linking these things all together through one continuous thread so people can think about them more clearly. Sounds good. So keep thinking about your questions, because I'm going to um, ask these guys one more question. I suppose, and I suppose building on that now, so we start to think about, um, you know, how do we educate um, our children with respect to these issues? Like, you know, particularly for um, uh, parents here who may not be LGBT themselves, um, kids ask so many questions. You know, how, how in your experience, um, and as parents, um, should you prepare for that? Or, or how do we think we can support kids asking questions? So Jill, do you want to take that? Um, I, the, the, I suppose we have, uh, both Amory and myself, are very committed to make sure that we create a comfortable environment in our home that our kids can t talk to us about anything, right? Because um, we are, I, I think it's because we're both psychotherapists, it's all about emotional well-being, and I, I know growing up in, in, in a home where you're not supposed to ask questions, you know, um, so, but still, you know, it still catches you, because uh, Phoenix started um, pre-kindergarten last year, and he was three years old. And, you know, I was, we were preparing ourselves for that question, you know, who's my daddy question. Mm. I thought when he was five, you know, six. No, one week after he started pre kindergarten, I was having dinner, I was just about to get my food into my mouth, and he was like, Mama, where's my daddy? And I was like, I nearly choked on my dinner because I didn't, I just, I knew it was coming, but I didn't realize it would come so quickly. So Amri and I was like, well, we had kind of rehearsed it. We were like, well, mama and mommy wanted to have a family and we couldn't, so we went down to a clinic and, uh, and there's a nice gentleman out in Denmark that when you are 18, you, can, you and your sister can get on a plane and go meet him and we'll be across the street in a cafe <laughs> with binoculars and probably a baseball bat waiting to make sure that this guy's a good guy, you know? So, so that, that, but this question comes up quite a bit, you know? And then the other question, speak your gender, because it's my pet peeve as a, you know, I identify as a woman, but as a young child, I always liked uh, things that are stereotypically boys stuff, you know, whether it's cars or whether it's uh, uh, sports or whatever, you know? So, um, so even now, like, so the boy or girl question, so I was always saying, you know, my our children identify a, as a boy or a girl, but who knows, you know, we're like, we're waiting to see if they, they might change their mind. But, but Phoenix has started, um, now he's questioning gender and he's exploring, he, he was wearing a, a dress the other day and I was like, this is fantastic. But he will look at me and say, no, mama, you're a boy. And I'm like, no, Phoenix, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a girl. I'm very comfortable with the fact that I'm a girl. But he's, he's obviously comparing me to the other moms in his school. And he looks, he sees that I'm, diff I'm different. I do things that are different to the other moms. And, and it's just very interesting. But when he asks those questions, I do feel as, that it almost triggers me, in a sense, where like, you know, our kids are great at that. They, they just know your buttons. And like, so he always like, no, you're a boy, mama. No, you're a boy. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and then the other thing about when I went buying um, g girls' clothes for my daughter, I found myself not wanting to buy pink, which is not a bad thing, but but it's not a, like to go avoid pink completely and to mm. not put her in a dress is also a bad thing because that shows my own shame about being a woman, you know. So uh, listen, I've, I've, I'm going to be in therapy for life, um, <laughs> but but these are things that are I'm const constantly questioning. And the beauty is that our kids feel that they can have this conversation with us at, at dinner, and they're then talking to their friends, and that's the best thing, you know. So just keep it open, and it's not comfortable, but that's not parenting is not meant to be comfortable. Sorry, it's not. It's not easy. <laughs> sorry. Um, maybe to you, Bella, because again, actually, maybe what age group of, of children are you typically um, talking to, and uh, how do you handle some of these questions? Um, mm -hmm. We are normally in secondary level school, mm -hmm. so anywhere between 11 and 18. Uh, the 18 year olds are like, we need to be studying, please go away. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the 11 year olds have a lot of very interesting questions and all the ages in between. Um, I think they're so starved for information that they're just like a flurry with all sorts of questions for us, um, particularly around some of the misinformation being spread about trans healthcare, particularly for young people. And, and it is actually coming from a place of concern, but they're like, I just, you know, I'm concerned about 10 year olds getting sex confirmation surgery. And I was like, 
when you needn't be this is not happening you know and you're you know it's a little bit concerning that this is just being bandied about like it's truth and I'm like if you want to know the actual reality of what it's like to try to access, access any sort of health care as a trans young person I can tell you it but certainly not anybody getting surgery you know at the age of 10 obviously um, but there is a worrying trend that I'm noticing at the moment of like alt-right material being brought up in the classroom so they'll be quoting you know the Jordan Petersons of this world wow. because it is being targeted towards young boys uh, you know on the internet like they're literally the alt rights trying to find impression young boys and giving them this material so they're saying to me like you know well Jordan Peterson says you know there's only two genders or whatever like that and what I try to do is say oh so you're, you're obviously well versed in, in this in queer theory great <laughs> let's have a chat <laughs> um, you know I, I'm a little concerned about that but what I'm hoping is they're gonna burn through this material real quick and come out the other side of it you know because these are these are smart intelligent curious young men and they're just being taken in by the dark side so um, unfortunately i have to know though what jordan peterson's saying because i have to be able to counteract it so that's that's pain in the butt um but yeah it's great it's great like children they have the best questions and the younger you get them the more cool they are with everything you know it's you know people say sometimes we don't want you going into our schools putting ideas in kids heads like oh, we're taking ideas out you know, we're trying to undo the nonsense you've all been doing, you know. Like, like all kids have a completely fluid sense of gender. Completely. You know, and we program them to think about it. And they become obsessed with it because they're trying to find the edges of it. That's why young, you know, probably why your kid's saying, you must be a boy. He's trying to figure it out because some kid has probably said something like, oh, girls wear dresses. And he's like, mm, my mom doesn't. So, you know, they're like this fundamentally makes no sense so let me run up against the walls of it and try to find the edges of it and we have no satisfying answers for them unfortunately because there is no edge it's, it just goes on forever and so to, to that point because you know you mentioned being able to kind of counteract with facts and you know provide the correct information like to to what extent is that useful versus as you say trying to find the edges of it <clears throat> i think at, you know you can give the information and you're giving it maybe not to that one kid but to everybody else who's listening but ultimately you don't have to get it to be respectful and that's ultimately what the goal of shout out is is saying that's cool you don't have to get it like that's fine but you know can you use the right pronouns can you be respectful can you be sound and most kids can they can do that even if they can't get their head around it like some some of these concepts are really confusing i can't even get my head around them either but like i can be nice <laughs> excellent so, um, questions, everybody. I'm sure you have lots of questions for these guys. Um, I had a question about how do you, uh, I guess it's a general parenting question, how do you prepare your kids for you know, the inevitability of them being seriously challenged on uh, either uh, the parents or the parenting or the ideals that are being put in their head? I'm sorry, I didn't, well, you know, the ideas are being raised with. And more than that, how do you prepare yourselves, uh, the parents among you, how do you prepare yourselves for when uh, you're being challenged by your child? Because every ch a child turns to a teenager and they become little monsters and you know, they experiment with you know, developing their own views and ideas and of course they want to challenge yours. And how do you prepare yourselves for that? Because that itself can become quite, well, hard and harsh. Uh, I suppose my children are slightly older than, than um, Dill or, or Sharan's. Um, they're aged between 16 and 21, and I have four. Um, and I, I think the thing, uh, there are exceptions to what I'm about to say, so, but I'll explain those in a moment. Um, it's honesty, and it's giving them as much information as you think they need to answer the questions they're asking you. So if they ask, um, you know, and this goes from when they're very young to, you know, um, why can't I pee standing up to, you know, to very simple things. Uh, uh, the Santa Claus thing is the lie I kept going and still keep going in my house. Excuse me, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, Santa Claus still comes and, okay. and they all write letters still. So that, that's, that's the one exception. But the you know, Oh, they all do, absolutely. Uh, that's the bitch of me. But, but I think it's, it's about honesty and a, a, about 
these are intelli- like whether they're three or 13 or 23, these are intelligent people who are absorbing what you're saying. And it's, it's, it's treating them with respect. So if, you know, and, and I, I think, you know, we, when we're talking about inclusive parenting, I think it's very important because it, what Bella's talking about ap- applies to everything across ability, across uh, race, across age, across all of these other things that are absolutely as much part of inclusive parenting as, as gender and sexuality. So I think it's, it's whatever question you're asked, you try and kind of pitch it to the level they will understand and be as honest as you can. You know, when they ask how babies are made, we tell them in the simplest possible way, how is the baby coming out? And I tell them, and they generally went, that's disgusting, <laughs> and, and moved on because now they know. But I, I remember one parent in the, in the primary school was pregnant with her fourth child, and her oldest child was about 10 or 11, and she told the children that the baby was found under a cabbage patch. And this isn't that long ago. And I'm kind of going like, why would you do that? I, you, so, so I think there's so many aspects to this, but it's honesty and, and, and knowing your audience. Um, it's so funny. Phoenix was at, at a ho- second home birth, so yeah. he knows exactly where babies <laughs> came from. <laughs> um, no, I, honestly, absolutely. But I, I think I did a lot of work on myself uh, to echo Sharon. You know, when you kind of decide to become a parent, you do so much work on yourself because, you know, as a couple, you know, it's like if there's any cracks, you know, <laughs> those cracks are going to be, they're going to explode open, you know. So, so you have to do a lot of work on yourself. And I was very conscious, and my wife as well, not to, tr- to try as best as possible not to pass on the intergenerational uh, hurt. Because I, I seriously believe this, ev- everyone has passed on a shitload of hurt from one generation to the other, you know. And, and for, I could very easily, you know, pass that on. I remember even as, as early as when Phoenix was like tiny and I, I remember going, wow, when he cried, I picked him up. I, I heard him, I responded. And it's something in my brain said, but that never happened to me. Why, why should he get that? You know, mm-hmm. so, so I, was, I was very conscious about these thought processes in my brain and I could go the old way and do exactly what my parents did or figure out a new way, which is like really unknown and really scary and probably go- going to be unsupported because all my family are going to say, why are you doing that? Why are you, why are you putting your baby in a, in, a, in a rack? Why are you co-sleeping? Why are you breastfeeding? You know, uh, wh- why aren't they in another room and uh, you know, all that kind of stuff? You know? So, so it's, it's d- doing a heck of a lot of work on yourself because your, your kids are going to challenge you and, and you need to be able to be challenged and you can't get, can't get all the answers right. You know, I'm, I always say to Phoenix, like even sometimes I, if I lose my temper, I'm like, I'm so sorry I lost my temper there. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I, we, we'll talk it out, we'll figure it out. And, and I know some questions he's gonna, I'll, I'll tell you what, one question he asked me two weeks ago and I, I was really upset when he asked me, you know, it, 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 uh, death. Because I think where, where do babies come from is it, not as difficult as what happens when you die, you know? So you are very straightforward. Like when you die, we die. As in like, you know, like, like a life that we have ends, you know. And then he, he deadpan looked at me, so that, does that mean you're going to die one day? Now, I'm doing the dishes, and do, trying to do dinner, right? <laughs> trying to do dinner. And all I wanted was to curl up in a ball and cry my eyes off because, like, oh, my God, you know, I'm not going to be here one day for him, you know? But I had to be really brave and say, actually, I'm not. But it's not going to happen for a really, 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 really long time. Okay, and then he skipped off. And I'm traumatized. <laughs> God, my psych, my therapist said, like, I need to see you today. Because I'm in pieces, you know. It's just so funny. But it's just knowing that you're not going to get it right, but just being open to learn, you know. <gasps> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so just to echo my friends here, um, I think that try to be, to have a safe environment as is possible to make sure that uh, they can bring up any questions that they come up to their head and try to be, to educate yourself as much as possible and even if you don't know the answer it's okay to be honest and just say I need some time to get back to you on that and I don't know the answer on those questions and um, try to be as well model as possible be a good listener and, and make sure that they feel comfortable to come with anything that comes up to their head and to be there, like we are in a stage that my son didn't luckily had managed to start asking those tough questions, but obviously they are constantly running in my head and I know that he will start asking those tough questions and I'm keep imagining in the, those scenarios and how I will react and how I will, uh, what will be my answers and how to um, address it. So to try to be prepared as much as possible, although kids as 
all very tough questions and we, you can never be prepared to uh, any questions that they come up with, but just to have this safe environment for them to try to be understanding and also be very, very honest if you don't know the answers and get back to that. Just uh, uh, one other observation. And uh, from very, when the kids were very young, your ages, your ages um, I insisted that we have family meals. And it is probably one of the best things we ever did. And I remember going, you know, back to the, the thing, the, the, let the let the wounds of the past project your future. Um, at dinner in our house when I was growing up, when the six o'clock news came on, everybody had to stop talking, you know, because it's the news. And okay, it was a different time, but but you know, uh, yeah, and, and, and it was on the radio, it was on the wireless. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so I have from get go said no screens, no phones, no. We don't have TV in the kitchen. The radio goes off. We are sitting here at dinner, and and even to this day, you know, last night there was only five of us at the dinner table. Uh, but you know, probably four or five times a week we will sit down at dinner, and often those meals, and it might be just you know spaghetti bolognese, will go on for two hours, because of the conversation. But that sitting as a family talking is probably one of the most important things I think you can do to, because otherwise there isn't communication and it's all about communication. More questions? Some questions in the back there, Yolanta? Um, this might be a question more for Shirin and Dil. Would you be comfortable sharing with us uh, your journey to same-sex parenting? And if so, um, tell us a bit more about the obstacles you had to overcome, especially from an administrative perspective. Okay. Right. <laughs> Draw your picture. We're taking notes now. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Draw your picture. Uh, no. So we, we. I think the first thing we did was talk to other uh, LGBTQ couples to figure out what way to do it. You know where to go and um, and uh, I, I, I kept hearing about this great clinic in Clane. Um, and uh, which is maybe not so good anymore, but, uh, yeah. but the, back then it was, right? Because it was privately owned. It was just one company based in Ireland and all sorts. Uh, so, so we went there and they were brilliant. And we, we took our time because, you know, I, when I met Anne Marie, I was 37. And it was like, literally, we knew each other five minutes and I'd already started talking about kids. <laughs> it's amazing. She didn't run out the door. Um, but it's like, it was literally like, I could see the last bus coming. So come on, leg it. Because I knew this conversation would take a while. It's not like you could literally you know, decide and then go get pregnant the following month. It was, it, I was 41 uh, by the time we actually had the resources, we were ready. Um, so it took, took a long time. So absolutely, uh, for, so for us, we felt more comfortable to do it here. And uh, we used a known donor um, uh, from, from Denmark, which is like a clinic that, that's, uh, that's like the biggest, uh, apparently, bank in the world. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and it worked out really well because then we used the same donor for our, for our daughter. And, and I keep thinking, you know, my parents, you know, when I told them I was a lesbian, I think I remember my parents, one of the first things they thought was like, oh God, we're not gonna have grandchildren, you know? And they, they all thought that my sister was gonna go off and have kids. <laughs> And she she didn't have kids and, and the lesbian ended up having kids. So <laughs> I think it's so I think it's so funny. Yeah, so it, it worked out really good. Some some couples decided to go get you know pregnant abroad, and some people use a, a person they know. You know, so it's very individual. You have to make up your own mind. And obviously, as a lesbian couple, we have two ovens. So it's much easier for us, you know. So I I, I would have loved to have had a perspective of two gay dads because that is an absolute you know, nightmare, especially with the a AHR bill still not mm -hmm. to coming through, you know, so, um, so yeah, so it would be much more challenging. But yeah, it can be done, but you need two people committed and, and a counseling would be really important because I, I've, I've always spoken to couples and sometimes one re really wants the baby and the other one doesn't. And, you know, so it's really good to kind of sit in front of someone and really figure out, you know, why do you want to have, start a family together? And that can then help you during the tough times because that fertility roller coaster, oh, I, I could talk hours about that, you know, so we were really lucky. It was a uh, second time I, I went for an IUI um, and it was great because I got the, I got to see what the theater looked like. I got to see the procedure, the little gown with the, with the gap at the back and you know, with your legs in the stuff. Yeah, oh. uh, but then when the IVF came around the second time, I got pregnant because I was already prepared, you know? Um, so, but I know couples who've gone six, seven, eight, nine times, and every time you're pregnant, you put all this hope and then it's crushed and it's really hard. So, so make sure you get some support while you're doing it. Thank you. Um, for us, uh, it was first 
doing a lot of research, educating ourselves, um, as they said, speaking with other couples, speaking with other parents, understanding what are the possibilities that we have around us if we want to um, uh, bring the kid with uh, someone that we know, if we want to have an open donor, if we want to have a closed donor, if we want to have uh, um, anonymous donor. So educate ourselves on all the options that we have and understanding what does it mean, understanding um, from where we can even buy the spam donor um, and from which banks are there and how can we even um, do the procedures. And obviously, yes, having a, this conversation between us and understanding uh, why we want to have a family, what is important to us, and understanding also deciding who will carry the baby. So for us, it was a decision that my wife will carry the baby because she's older than me. And um, <laughs> 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 Text some ages in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, just there, uh, first, as I mentioned, to educate ourselves to do the research, and then we decided uh, we did the procedure in Israel. So, we decided um, actually to bring um, a donor, a spam donor from uh, US. And for us, the decision was to have um, an open donor meaning that our kid will be able to contact the donor when he will be 18. Um, it was an important decision for us because we thought that we cannot decide for our kid if he will know the donor or not, and it's something that we should uh, leave it for him to decide. Obviously, there is also cost uh, effective of that, um, so open donor costs more than any other donor. Um, so we did the we brought the spam from US uh, to Israel, and then we uh, started the procedure there. We managed to uh, my wife got managed to get pregnant. She always uh, ate the fact that I'm saying we when she was the one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, get pregnant on our fourth uh, attempt. Um, and we were lucky because it was actually just about um, our flight to Dublin before moving here to Dublin. So it was our, our last attempt before moving to Dublin and we, we got lucky on that. And as I mentioned earlier, for us um, also the struggle was about the birth certificate. Um, unfortunately, it was a huge issue for us because it was important for both of us to be registered as the mom of the kid. And um, here in Dublin, it's unfortunate, but we, it cannot happen. So for us, um, we went to Belfast in order to have uh, to the, to, for the delivery of our kid. Um, unfortunately, still in Israel, I'm not registered as a mom of the kid because over there it's still illegal as well. So I'm only here um, in Dublin now and in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Question beside you. Yeah. Um, thanks. So uh, this w also would be a, a little bit more about same-sex parenting. So my husband and I have recently started uh, looking into this, and one of the things that we that worried us a little bit is what could potentially happen uh, when the kid gets to school. Uh, in particular, we read or heard about kids uh, sometimes getting bullied because they have two same-sex parents, or sometimes. Uh, we realized that some kids might feel the pressure uh, about coming out to their peers and talk about their family. So I was wondering if you ever thought of these aspects and how would you feel like um, handling these worries? Yeah. Maybe actually, Bella, just to, to, it might be useful to get some of your insights in, in terms of the work you see in school. Uh, yeah, sure. Like, um, I was actually talking to a, a parent the other day who's. Um, has a kid from a previous relationship and the his kid is like three and he hasn't told his kid that he's gay um, because it hasn't come up. But if you have two dads, I think it uh, com comes up faster probably. Um, yeah, there is that worry. Kids get, you know, picked on for lots of different reasons and we wouldn't stop them going out into the world. You know, they could have, you know, a, a disability that, you know, kids have many questions about they could you know even I got asked as a kid you know you know where's your dad and things like that as long as you keep it that they can always come back to you and tell you what their day was like and have that constant dialogue like my uh, my mom asked me every single day how was my day you know and like having that like the dinner time or something like that so they can talk to you about it but you just can't take that on as something you've done to your kid because you're not doing it to your kid. It's, you know, it's everybody else will get better. And unfortunately, this generation of kids are kind of the groundbreakers. And that's, that's difficult in a way that you, you don't want your kid to be the groundbreakers, but 
they will be and it will be all for the better ultimately but you know it will actually be coming from adults not the kids the kids will be confused they'll ask they'll get an explanation they'll be like that's fine when's lunch you know particularly at a young age you know get them into to preschool and then you know they'll be going, it'll be adults so you got to have a chat you got to like you know get some tough skin have some chats but i'm sure one of you can probably answer that as well I think for, for us, like, it's not just the, the same-sex parenting part uh, for us. We, we are very, as parents, quite alternative, if you haven't guessed, you know, with the, with the home births and the breastfeeding and this and that. Yeah, it's, which, which is for me so sad in a way because, yeah, uh, that's how people used to give birth before, you know. So, uh, so in many ways, we are very non-mainstream. So, so we are constantly having, if it's uh, conversations with family members or with friends, you know, so we constantly feel we are... We're the trailblazers, and sometimes it just gets very tiring. But we we found our tribe in relation to a school. Um, we send, speaking of no screens, the Steiner, uh, which is a, a kind of a, a school that has no screens, no plastic. You play only outside, you know. So um, there's some great ones in, in in Ireland. They're just really they're really taking on because I think parents are becoming quite aware that uh, you know, educate together are, are great, you know, but th there is a lot of emphasis on technology, there's a lot of emphasis, the classes are quite big as well, you know, so, so we feel um, this, you know, be involved, you know, uh, do the research, because uh, I, I, I talk to so many parents because it's okay, so when I was trying to get pregnant, I was talking to people, uh, when I was pregnant and then trying to figure out how to give birth in Ireland, you know, hospital, this, that, and that. So, uh, and then when it came to schooling, I talked to homeschoolers, I talked to everybody. I didn't rule anybody out, you know? And I feel we, we are very much on the, uh, that, uh, that end where if so something was to happen to the school, we would homeschool tomorrow. Because that's how, how passionate we are about, because a children's emotional well-being is so important. And working in mental health as a psychotherapist, we get calls every day from, parents who are worried about their five-year-old, eight-year-old, 12-year-old, 15-year-old, uh, and a lot of the mental health issues are there because of what's happening in school, because of social media, because of bullying and all that. So, so I'm very conscious that there are a lot of people who are working in the schools who mean really, really well, but the system itself, you know, the pressure to do the junior cert, the pressure to do the leaving cert, to me, that for me is the biggest worry. Uh, we, in relation to bullying, absolutely on a daily basis, you check in with your, with your kid, but I think if you give them that emotional resilience, where they'll be able to stand up, and I've already, I can already see it in, in Phoenix as a four-year-old, uh, you know, say correcting people. No, I have two mums, you know, and it, he's going to get more and more um, stronger with, with that, you know, and uh, and yeah. So so sometimes I, I think that there's a it's a bigger conversation around um, just the environment that the kids grow up in, especially with, if you're a same-sex parent. There's a lot of other, you know, parents in general are quite worried about the, the system, you know, so it's really important to question. Just because everybody's doing this thing or this way, it doesn't mean that it might necessarily uh, fit you. So as your individuals, when you, be, when you become a parent, remain an individual. Don't feel that you have to conform and, and just go with everybody else. Just make sure that you do what is best. Child-led, you said child-led, but it's baby-led weaning, whether it's baby-led potty training, whether it's, baby, you know, whatever it is, your child, a lot of people can't have this idea that children are like a, a, bl um, a, a blank uh, canvas, you know, a, a, a clean slate. Not at all. Not at all. I feel my greatest teachers are my children. I've learned more from my children than I've learned from anybody else. Ask them. They will tell you where, where, where to go. So, thanks. Thank you. Yes, so, so let's be honest. Kids are mean. <laughs> uh, and and unfortunately, this is the, this is the fact of the world. And I don't think that um, we can stop like them from bullying. Although I wish we could, uh, and we can only try to do our best in order to educate, to raise awareness, and to try to change things. So for me, um, I will do everything in my power in order to protect my son and to and teach him to be resilient and to teach him to stand up for himself and for others and to try to be the one that also change things around but i also will be the one that uh, will stand up and to try to change things for the for him and for other kids in order to make sure that uh, we are in a world that are progressing and we are in a world that is changing and for the better so we're almost out of time um I just did want to build on that point um, around kind of building resilience, but if we kind of flip it around, like I'd love to get your advice on how as parents can uh, parents uh, help all children become more accepting um, in those situations so that bullying isn't as much of an issue. 
Uh, well, from my perspective, um, you just don't, uh, it, it, they learn by example. Yeah. You know, we talked about child ed, but if, I, if, if I'm walking down the street, you know, I hate people who throw rubbish. Mm -hmm. You know, and if I saw one of my kids throwing rubbish, I'd be furious, you know. But they don't throw rubbish because we don't throw rubbish. And, and they don't stare at people in a wheelchair because we don't stare at people or people of color or people who are older or people who have a disability or who are gay or whatever. And, and uh, it's that openness and communication. And, and you, you know, they, all of my kids have been bullied. Um, one in particular was bullied very badly and uh, that's a whole different story. Um, but what I tried to do for my child is say, look, this is who you are. Focus on your ability, your strength and a huge amount of emotional and and just you know that like he didn't leave the you talk about co uh, you know the 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 the, uh, the, the, the co-sleeping like uh, i think he was about 13 before he actually moved into his own Yay. room um, <laughs> now he had his own room and he did leave for a, a lot and we'd move him at, at night but he he just needed that physical he needed to know there was a safe place and uh, so i think it's example and knowing that and giving them the security to believe that they are fantastic people, regardless of the really, really vicious, horrible things people say. And it's not just kids, we know that. This happens in the workplace, this happens walking down the street, this happens, you know, everywhere. So it's, it's knowing they're loved and they have real value. Yeah, like it starts with you, you know. Um, we are all sexist, racist, ableist, misogynistic, uh, garbage people. Um, <laughs> just trying to be less garbagey every day. Well, time is today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get yeah. March. Like, yeah, exactly. Like we are all um, just undoing all of that damage. Like I cannot sit here and say that I am not a racist, misogynist, ableist. I am. So you have to start from that from the beginning and just try to see equal value in every single person because you've been programmed not to do that, and you can actually so much through your child's eyes see the world anew and let them lead the way in terms of um, you know seeing the beauty in the world because kids just think everything's just so great like you know they're fantastic but also they're all individuals you know while some kid needs you know that type of security and i was one of those kids i needed a lot of reassurance a lot of security another kid needs a lot of space you know so there's no normal and then just like you know we as individuals shouldn't be comparing our chapter two to someone else's chapter 15 in their book and you know don't do that with other people's kids and and the in oh, the instagram don't you oh. know <laughs> yeah. you know you never know uh, what a fight it was to get that picture of the two kids holding hands looking at the sunset and they've mm -hmm. done that to fill some sort of void so you know just like don't judge yourself against the none, none of it no no matter if you're a parent or anything uh just like you know delete instagram maybe self-awareness for me is like paramount in uh, in parenting you know your own self-awareness uh, the better you know yourself uh, the better you can then trust your instinct. Because I think it, uh, you doubt yourself a million times a day, am I doing the right thing? Uh, should I be doing this? Should I be more like the other mom in, 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 in the school, you know? Because she seems to have it all together more than I do, you know? But, but if you believe in yourself and obviously know yourself, you'll know what is right for you and your child, you know? And then that self-awareness will then be transfer to your child because you're constantly you know because i remember as as a as a kid it no one ever asked me what do i want to do you know how do i feel about this you know um, and it really annoys me because it was all about uh fulfilling my duty as a daughter you know fulfilling my duty as a woman in society you know um living for others caring for others you know um not, not speak out even if you, if i knew that I, sh I should you know so so it's it's being able to instill those messages in our children because if they become self-aware they then will look inwards and if they want to change the world they will do it because they actually want to from inside not because they feel a sense of responsibility oh everybody's doing it there and that's not gonna cut it you know you want people to really understand uh, you know ins inspiring change in self and society that's something my, my wife and i really care about and so from a mental health point of view if you know if we look after us there's a great saying if you um, heal the wounds of what hurt you you won't bleed on the people mm. who didn't cut you, you know. But unfortunately, that's why there's so much wrong in the world today because we are we are passing on 
the hurt to somebody else instead of actually looking at ourselves confronting the the trauma the, the demons the whatever and then letting it go so that's i so i, so I think the b best thing that you can we can help our children if they can become self-aware uh yes of course the books and everything are that's all important but just know yourself first I'm just very conscious that um, I might sound like, you know, uh, Parenting 101, this is how to do it. And I, I just want to be absolutely reassure you, I am the least Instagram parent. Like, if, if my children were here, they would be going, it's all lies, mum, you know, and you've made it all up, it's not true. Because parenting, as Jill said, is really hard work. And sometimes, and a lot of the time, I'm really shit at it. And you know what I mean? So it's, it's it, all you can do is try and wake up and say, okay, I screwed up yesterday. What can I try and do today? And it's, so it's 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 not that you know everything's perfect in our world. It most certainly isn't, and I don't know any family that it is. So I don't want to put that impression across. <laughs> you know, we just try. Yeah, uh, just to echo that, like um, be the role model for our kids, and to ensure that the, we are showing them how to um, respect each other, how to show compassion, how to treat each person individual and to respect them for who they are, and uh, to also to be able and comfortable to be the true self in a group and uh, understand that the group value, but also understand how they can be them true self and be um, we very much self-aware, as you mentioned, and understand the world and also the differences inside of it. So sadly, we are out of time. Um, I firstly want to apologize for a rather sweary Lynn Tracy. I know, um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Some people here know that. So <laughs> um, but more importantly, I want to thank all of the panel. So I want to thank Dill, Bella, Lynn, and Sharan for joining us here today. So thank you very much.